Okay, let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for another day just to be alive and to have the privilege of standing firm in the faith for the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we ask that you open our eyes this evening to what we need to see. Humble our hearts as well. Help us accept any warnings you have for us so that we can be alert and not naive to the things in this world. And Father, most of all, we are just grateful and thankful that you gave up your son for us. He who was perfect, without spot or blemish, and yet took the judgment for all of our sins so that whoever trusts in him can be saved forever and ever. Father, please bless this message. Guide us by your Holy Spirit. And it's in Christ's precious name we pray, by the power of your Spirit. Amen. All right, at this point I want to invite uh, Deacon Johnson up. Again, he's going to say a few words about um, Sunday's lesson, as it was pretty uh, impactful for us all, to say the least. Thank you, Scott. Can anybody hear me? Okay. Uh, first, I would like to thank Pastor Collins for the time he has allowed for me to share uh, with my congregation some personal thoughts after uh, hearing Sunday morning's message from behind his pulpit as a deacon of this ministry. I'd like to share with you all what has worn on my heart for the last couple of days after I listened to Sunday's message. I want to start with, if you haven't seen Sunday morning's message, uh, this is a must, must watch. Um, for the Spirit used this lesson to catapult my thinking to an on God status uh, and slap me in the face and say, wake up, stupid. Um, that's pretty much what I got out of that message. He just wanted to punk, punch me in the throat, the spirit did, and he did. So let me explain. I think I have been getting familiar and taking for granted the blessings that God has been given me as a child of his and being misled as to the priorities in this life. Our priorities first and foremost is to please God and not men. So turn to 1 Thessalonians 4, 1, please. First Thessalonians 4, 1, Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us instructions as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you excel still more. Please turn to Romans 8.8. 8. <clears throat> Romans 8, 8, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. We know these scriptures. If we link these passages together, we find that to please God, we have instructions that have to be followed, and we can never do it in the flesh, only under, the pow under his power, the power of the Spirit. Well, you ask, how does his power come to us? Well, I'm glad you asked that. When we, <laughs> when we submit humbly to the gospel, we become his children, sons of God. That's where the journey begins. But he gives us all the tools for us before the journey begins. At salvation, he gives us his spirit so we can understand truth. Turn to John 16, 7. John 16, 7. But I tell you the truth. 
it is to your advantage that I go away. This is Jesus Christ speaking. For if I do not go away, the helper, which will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. He gives us the Bible, which is the word of God, the mind of Christ. Turn to 1 Corinthians 2, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 2:16. First Corinthians 2.16 For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him but we have the mind of Christ and he gives us under shepherds to guide the sheep the stupid sheep in my case turn to Ephesians 4.11 to 12 another familiar passage but don't get familiar like I did Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, and he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. We have been given a great example to follow in this respect, our pastor. I take this for granted sometimes, as do most of you. I reviewed over hundreds of lessons in my mind over the last few days, and I was reminded of the warning and the preparation that has been coming from this pulpit to us on a consistent basis. Preparing us for these coming days. I heard the voice of Pastor Ed as he warned us about the world system and its helpers dragging us away from truth and our responsibilities to this ministry, and even to pastor in my case. Well, Sunday morning's message woke me up, and I hope it will do the same for you. Remember, these are all gifts from God that we have, and we should never take them for granted because they can go away in an instant. I repeat, they can be taken away in an instant. We have to keep that in our mind. Turn to Ephesians 6, 12, please. Ephesians 6, 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places, and who they use. Most of the time, it's people that are close to you. So I want to close with one final passage that struck me hard this morning as I was preparing to share this with you tonight. Turn to 2 Timothy 4.3, please. And this is something that we don't want to happen to this congregation. For, in t for the time will come when they will not endure a sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. Everybody's familiar with this passage, I assume. But I thought of this, their own desires. What does that represent? Their own desires represents anything or anyone that is not in accordance with God's provision. For you, your walk... This is what the, your pastor has been warning against. He's warning against people dragging us away from the faith. So as I talked with some people about this over the last few days, um, I'm not going to name names, but I talked to a few people that I have confidence in the faith, and a few key ideas popped into my head as to guard against this in my own life. First and foremost, I need to listen to the Holy Spirit and take his guidance. That's first and foremost. Second, listen to the pastor teacher and what the Spirit is saying through him while he's still available, while he is still there, while this church is still open. Don't take anything for granted. And then finally, read your Bibles and learn from your past failures like I have done and walk the walk God intended you to glorify him. Thank you. All right.
great. Thanks, DJ. Always good to hear another perspective and uh, appreciate your humility. And you got to, you know, like uh, look in the mirror, right? We each have to look in the mirror. Uh, it's real easy to brush teachings off as for somebody else. But uh, the Holy Spirit has you in this church right now. And the messages that come forth are for you in some way, are for each one of us in some way. You know, even if it doesn't strike us uh, right away as being a problem in our lives. Uh, and the thing I just got out of what DJ shared is that God has provided. God always provides before the problem, before the test. Scripture tells us that. And God has provided us everything we could ever need to be uh, equipped and ready for what's next. And we've been getting a steady dose of warnings. Um, I want to share with you something Pastor Collins wanted me to share with you on the board. We are under unprecedented, unprecedented attack in our church. If you don't see it, you're either passively ignoring it or actively part of the problem. Wake up. And that's saying a lot to say we're under unprecedented attack because we've had a lot of attacks over the years, the last 10 years in this church. So look in the mirror, like which category do you fall in? You know, instead of saying that's not me, maybe be humble and say, all right, I'm probably guilty. Which category do you fall in? Um, we all need to wake up. We all need to just be um, alert. Because there's clear warnings coming. It's like someone shouting from a tower. You know, the enemy's coming. Don't ignore that. Either it's from God or it's not from God. So these are subtle things. Um, if our dear pastor, who has a heart for the Lord, sees something, shouldn't we heed the warning? I mean, if you believe your pastor... <laughs> has a heart for God, and um, he's saying things that maybe you don't see right now. Shouldn't we at least heed the warning even if you don't see it yet? Of course. And what have we been learning? That Satan and his agents use subtle ways to infiltrate the church and even the hearts of men. He doesn't come at us from the front in obvious ways. Maybe when you're a new believer, he does that. But now he comes at you from the side as you're getting more into the word. He comes and sneaks around the corner, so to speak, and uses people that we love and that are close to us to drag us away. Because you know what? You'll listen to someone you love. You won't listen to some guy in the street telling you not to go to Bible class. But you listen to someone you love telling you to go to a little too much Bible class. We, we do it. So that's what pastor sees, and that's part of uh, his spiritual gift. And he's asking us to open our eyes and consider these things so that we uh, can protect our souls and protect each other and protect God's church, what's going on in this building. So if you don't see it, open your mind to the fact that things are amiss around you personally, even in your own lives. And there are subtle attacks going on against all of us. Just because you don't see them doesn't mean they're not happening in your own life, maybe right under your nose. So trust that the Spirit is guiding us and our pastor, bringing things up that we just don't see clearly so that we'll be on guard and not be taken captive by the lies of this world. And in humility, accept the warning as from God. It's for you, personally. It's for each of us, personally. Amen? All right. So changing gears a bit as we review Sunday's lesson, which has, you know, some of this in it, too, but we also talked a lot about weaknesses. And in the light of learning to be content with our weaknesses, realizing that that very thing, weakness, is what pulls us closer to God and relying on His power instead of our own. We've also been given some better definitions 
from the Holy Spirit uh, regarding a divine perspective on weaknesses. On the board regarding wisdom on weaknesses, and I needed a check on this in my own soul, things such as unforgiveness, judging, jealousy, envy, strife, coveting, doubting, etc., these are all real weaknesses. While the world tries to focus our attention on human weaknesses, such as lack of strength, intellect, or social skills, what we need to understand is that the weaknesses the Bible speaks to are on a different plane. So when we think of weaknesses, we might think of those things that we lack, almost in the worldly sense or in our daily you know, lives, strength, intellect, etc. But, you know, from a divine perspective, look at all the sins listed at the top, like unforgiveness and judging and jealousy and strife, etc., etc. Those are real weaknesses. So once again, our problem, if you look at what's on the board there, is that we look at what we can see rather than at the heart. We look at things we can see rather than at the heart. We're shallow creatures, aren't we? So even that is part of our problem in not recognizing subtle attacks. Think about it. Even that is part of our problem in not recognizing subtle attacks, even from within our inner circles. So we too often look at the surface, the superficial, surface-level situations. And I speak from personal experience, too. But sometimes we don't dive deeper. Uh, We don't ask what's really going on behind the scenes in a situation in our lives. Or what's going on in the motivation of certain actions, both in self and others. And that's what we, we we need to start being more in tune spiritually. Turning your Bibles to 1 Samuel 16, verse 1. 1 Samuel 16, 1. So as is frequent, our problems are often that we look at what we can see easily on the surface, but we don't look at the underneath, the underlying uh, issues, which is what God does. 1 Samuel 16, 1. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have selected a king for myself among his sons. But Samuel said, How can I go? When Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. You shall invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do, and you shall anoint for me the one whom I designate to you. So Samuel did what the Lord said and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the city came trembling to meet him. Isn't that interesting? They were like, are you here in judgment? Or are you here for, uh, you know, the peace offering or something? So the elders of the city came trembling to meet him and said, Do you come in peace? He said, In peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. He also consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they entered, he looked at Eliab. This is Samuel now, the prophet. He looked at Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. The world has taught us to look at human strengths. We've been so trained in this way since youth to judge what strength is and what weakness is by what we basically see. But true strength is of the Spirit and therefore of God. True strength is from or or of the Spirit and therefore of God. And we need to start looking at things like God does. We all do. God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are far beyond our thoughts in Isaiah 55. 
So we've got to come off our own plane and ask for the Spirit's guidance to open up our eyes to the things behind the scenes. Through His Word and His Spirit, if we're listening, if we're humbly accepting what the Spirit's telling us right now even from the pulpit, if we're listening, we can then see spiritual things, the battles that are going on, maybe right under our nose, that we can be naive to sometimes. Uh, God wants to show us His perspective on things. He wants to show us the uh, battle right, you know, going on right in our side pocket, so to speak. The person that might be devising against us that we have no clue is devising against us because we love them. God wants to show us and reveal these things to us, but He's not going to do it if we're not humble, if we're not accepting the message. On the board, Colossians 3, 2 in the Amplified, set your mind and keep focused habitually on the things above, the heavenly things, not on things that are on the earth, which have only temporal value. So where do we set our mind every day? Again, the world wants us to look at the flesh and its earthly strengths. But as you know, if you've been into the Word of God for any amount of time, that is a miserable path to take. Earthly, fleshly strengths always let us down in the end. We know that. So watch where you look. Be careful what you're looking at. In Matthew 16, 23, Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. What was the problem? Peter had a good heart, but he was not setting his mind on God's interests, but on his own interests. So there's the danger that we, mankind, are constantly in. Even believers, as we see here with Peter. So on the board, be on the alert. How long has the Spirit been telling us to be on the alert? To guard our hearts. Be on guard for earthly thinking about man's interests. It's been with us since youth. And through the flesh, it's always hanging out, waiting to strike down our godly perspective. Again, be on guard for earthly thinking about man's interests. We, you ask yourself, look in the mirror. Have I been focusing on man's interests, earthly things, or ways to get by, ways to survive, get through my day? That's how we've been trained since youth. And that's why we're here learning the Word of God, to get the right perspective. But that earthly perspective is always lurking and waiting to strike down our godly perspective. So how do you, how do you avoid that? Be on the alert. Like always, be on the alert. You're a soldier in active duty for Jesus Christ. Our time to rest and rejoice, really, is in heaven. Our time to say our job is done, so to speak, is in heaven when the Lord calls us. But right now we're here with this divine mission and we'll be uh, missing the boat, missing the big picture if we don't stay on the alert. So turn on, our, on your Bibles again to Philippians 3.18. Philippians 3.18. Again, be on guard for earthly thinking about man's interests. It's been with us since youth, and through the flesh, it's always hanging out, waiting to strike down our godly perspective. So be on the alert. Verse 18. For many walk, of whom I often told you, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Now stop right here for a minute. Some of you are in denial that, quote-unquote, good people that you know could be enemies of the cross. Good people that you know could be enemies of the cross. You need to wake up. You need to not be deceived. Because enemies of the cross come in all shapes and sizes. And their basic similarity is they don't live for Christ. That's how we can, you know, basically tell but we need to wake up and stop um, being in denial that 
because so and so is a good person and they love me that they can't they can't be an enemy of the cross. The Bible says they can. So think about those that you might be partial or biased towards because you love them. And you might actually compromise God's ways with them. How ugly is that? And we all do it, probably all to different degrees, but compromise God's ways with them because you love them, because you don't want to offend them, because you don't want any um, you know, strife between you, where Jesus said, I come to divide families, two against three and three against two, for the truth. In verse 19, these enemies of the cross, their end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame who set their minds on earthly things. There's your similarity. And there's an indicator right there. How do we know if someone is on the right path with God or if they're playing a game with you and God, even using God's name? How do we know if someone's on the right path, so to speak, or we should be spending our intimate time with them as friends even? Do they set their minds constantly on earthly things? That's a really good indicator. Be honest. Don't be biased. They are living as an enemy of the cross if they are constantly setting their mind on earthly things. We all fail in that area from time to time. We're talking about a lifestyle. We're talking about people that don't care at all about God and Christ. Whether you don't want to accept that because they're a good person, let's say, or because you love them, that's your choice, but you are offending God in the process. You're insulting God in the process. If you're condoning evil, if you're condoning their lifestyle, sometimes by your very presence, and you know it's against God, you're offending Christ's name just by being there because they know where you supposedly stand. So let's be objective. Let's be truthful and honest. Jesus said you will know them by their fruit. This doesn't mean to go around judging people. It means be careful who you're hanging out with. Be careful that you're not being dragged away in the name of love. Really in the name of partiality. Be on guard for false pretenses. And people saying the things you want to hear just to keep themselves in your good graces. Are the people in your life honoring God or not? Are those that you hang out with, more importantly, are they honoring God or not? And that should determine the intimacy level of our relationship with them. On the board in Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. That's the reality. We just read that in Philippians 3, the enemies of the cross. The end of their way is death. So be careful that you don't get swooped into that. That's what the Spirit's saying. Like, who do you think you are to, that you won't be affected? And who do you think you are to condone something going on in, in a loved one's life that you know is directly against God? We need to adopt God's perspective and live by it. So we've been pressed by the Spirit lately to know our enemies and to realize this world is constantly lying to us. That's been coming from the pulpit a lot the last two weeks. You are being constantly lied to, whether you realize it or not. If you don't believe that and realize that, you will be deceived quite easily in this world, even by people that love you. And before you know it, you're off to the side. You're out of God's plan for your life. So, again, the Spirit's saying over and over, stand guard. Guard your hearts. They're vulnerable. And on the board, do you really believe this verse, 1 Peter 5, 8? Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Do you really believe that? Or is he like, you know, looking the other way with you? And I don't mean Satan, but his army, his minions. What, because you're what, a good person? 
He's not bothering you? Do you believe this on the board? He's prowling around you, circling you like a lion, saying, when's the right time to attack? How can I attack them without them knowing it, without them seeing it? And remember, one of Satan's greatest weapons he uses to devour us is lies. John 8, the devil does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is the liar and the father of lies. One of his main weapons. In this world, we're surrounded by liars and their carrots. They're little dangling carrots. Constantly. This is a constant in the devil's world, which is why we must never drop our guard. So think about it. Satan even lies about what true strengths and weaknesses are. Getting you to look at the wrong things. Deceiving you so you're not looking at the real weaknesses. Again, on the board, we saw this on Sunday, there's no truth in him. That's what John 8:44 says. There is no truth in him. Zero. And that's the same creature that is temporarily running this world. So do you have like wrong expectations about what you're going to face in the world? The same creature that has no truth in him is the same one running the world right now temporarily. I mean, we should, in our minds, we should like set our minds to be totally against the world's ways. You know, it's a mindset that we don't um, always have. We, we uh, give in a little bit. We say, well, that's not that bad. This is bad, but that's not that bad. And many times the thing that's not that bad is the subtle one that really can ruin you. So start, you know, change your perspective. This world is against God. And you shouldn't expect anything really good from it. So the system in the world is just like Satan is, void of truth. Full of good-looking counterfeits, by the way, but void of truth. Full of even counterfeit loves, you see on TV shows all the time, but void of truth. Void of God's love. Some people call the world the machine. Whatever you want to call it, there's a system in place, and it's ramped up, and it's getting faster and different and uh, more complex, and Satan's like, yeah, this is really starting to gel. You know, I know the end is coming, but look at my system. It's really starting to gel. It's really starting to get confusing and more deceptive. That's what you have to be on guard for constantly. And as Pastor mentioned on Sunday, this means that everything in this world is backwards. Set your mind that way. And that's why we need a spiritual reality check on the board. We can't expect to hang out with people that love the world and not have it affect us. It will rub off on us. You're weak. We're weak. We're not strong enough to not be affected by worldly lusts. Are you ready to make that claim? That you're strong enough now spiritually to not be affected by worldly lusts? Could be all kinds of lust, but how arrogant would that be to jump to that conclusion? The Bible repeatedly warns us to stay away from ungodliness, lest we catch it like a virus, so to speak. Stay away from ungodliness. Stay away from ungodliness. That means staying away from ungodly people. That might even be nice people, good people. That's who Satan uses a lot. If he's going to deceive you, how's he going to deceive you with an obviously evil person? Right? He can't deceive you that way. You, you know. You, you know. It's clear. What does he do, though? He uses loved ones who really aren't following God to infiltrate you, to sway you. Okay? And they may not even know what they're doing. I'm not saying that they're overtly being evil, like on purpose. Many times they don't even know what they're doing. They don't realize how trapped they are in the world system and that they're swaying you away from God. So what do you got to do? Don't judge them, but protect yourself. Protect yourself. 
your soul's vulnerable. Just like we're told to stay on the narrow path that leads to life. That's for our own protection and spiritual well-being so that we can be a good soldier of Christ and not fall away. Go in your Bibles again to uh, 2 Corinthians 7, 1. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. <clears throat> we'll do a little more review and uh, we'll see how far we get this evening. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit. On the board, we saw MacArthur on 2 Corinthians 7, 1. False religion panders to the human appetites, represented by both flesh and spirit. While some believers for a time might avoid succumbing to fleshly sins associated with false religion, the Christian who exposes his mind to false teaching cannot avoid con contamination by the devilish ideologies and blasphemies that assault the purity of divine truth and blaspheme God's name. There's a lot there. But if you expose your mind to the wrong things or the wrong people, you can't avoid contamination. So be on guard. If people are living lives without Christ, people you love, but they're trapped in the world system, this doesn't mean don't evangelize them. It doesn't mean don't look for opportunities or pray about opportunities or when you are with them to bring the Lord up, maybe again, maybe not. Might not be the right time. It doesn't mean don't look for those opportunities. It means don't spend intimate time with these people that are living a life against Christ because you're going down. You will go down. They're trapped in the world system, whether they realize it or not, and they're living in and promoting lies because that's what the world system does, and they're entrenched in it. They're like soaked. It's like going underwater. Every part of you gets wet. They're entrenched in the world system. They're soaked in it. So when you touch them, you're going to get wet. You know, you can't not get wet. Be careful who you spend this intimate time with. So again, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be compassionate or have a, a right attitude towards them. Praying for them like the Lord's attitude on the board in Luke 23, 34. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. That's the right attitude. That's the compassionate attitude. That's the prayerful attitude. But it does not, or it does mean, be careful who you spend time with and who you call your friends. The Spirit's been pretty emphatic on this, hasn't he? Especially on Sunday. Ooh, thought the pulpit was going to break for a minute. It's looking good. But on the board, be careful who it is that you call friend. That's like a, a special place in your lives. It should be. It should be a sanctified place who you call friend, especially as a believer. And even the Bible says if you're lucky to have two or three friends, you're blessed. We're talking about real friends. We're talking about God-fearing friends. Be careful who it is that you call friend. A smart enemy will try to infiltrate your camp, acquiring agents on the inside to sneak up on you in your own camp, your own little, cir little cir inner circle. Everyone has some kind of an inner circle in their lives. It might be one or two people, but be careful who you call friend in the intimate sense. Satan and his agents will infiltrate the souls of some of those that you love, unfortunately. And he will sway their souls to love selfishly away from Christ and his love. You say, they're a good person. They don't love selfishly. Then why do they want so much time from you? And why do they even say, you don't really have to go to Bible class every night, do you? What are they saying? I want more of you. It's selfish. 
I want more of you. Maybe I need more of you, they say. Maybe they even shed a tear. You think Satan wouldn't use that to pull you away from Christ as your number one priority? So just like be, be uh, uh, again, alert to his wiles, his ways, okay? They may not know what they're doing, but they're still even unknowingly trying to sway you away from Christ. They're loving selfishly. These might even be people who were into the word of God at one time or that claim to be believers, but their actions speak so loudly you shouldn't hear a word they say. Their actions speak so loudly, their lifestyle. You shouldn't be listening to a word they say. We must be on guard, not listening to or accepting the words of those who live lives against God's word. Be careful what wisdom you, you know. If you give somebody your ear too much, like you're giving them too much credit or too much respect, and they're not into God's word, they're, they're not living for God at all, they're not God-fearing, they may not be saved. If you're giving them too much respect with what they say, you're, you're putting yourself in danger. You should be like, you know what? I'm not going to accept their words as true. Okay, I'm going like, to consider them maybe, but I'm not just going to buy them hook, line, and sinker because I love them. As we saw on Sunday, King David was sad about this reality in his life, and understandably so. And this is the reality in our own lives as well, although we may choose not to see it. And that's what the Spirit's yelling at us with, even on Sunday. Are you choosing not to see it? Are you being partial to your loved ones? Are you turning a blind eye to something that you know is wrong just so you don't disturb the apple cart in that relationship? If so, you might be offending God. Serious stuff. Look at the Old Testament. Read the Old Testament. You don't think God takes that seriously when, you, when we compromise His standards out of partiality for people that we love. So this came out on Sunday on the board, the idea that friends can be enemies. It's a hard pill to swallow when you realize that loved ones are working for the enemy, against God, that is. But it's a reality in this the devil's world. So be ready to stand firm. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. This doesn't mean it's not a hard pill to swallow. It doesn't mean that you're not sad about it or praying for them, compassionate even. It's a hard pill to swallow when you realize that loved ones are working for the enemy, against God, that is. But it's a reality in this, the devil's world. So be ready to stand firm. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Look at 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So he's real, and he's hurting people we love. It sucks, you know. Um, it's painful at times. But call it what it is, at least. Don't be like, ah, you know, it's not really happening. That's what Saint would like you to say. And turn to 1 Corinthians 16, 13. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. <clears throat> Again, sometimes friends can be enemies. They may not know it, but that's still the reality of the situation. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Be on the alert. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Notice we can be doing all things in love and yet stand firm at the same time. Be on the alert at the same time. Be strong at the same time. In fact, love for Christ is what motivates all these types of activities. 
the standing firm, the being strong, um, being on the alert, acting like men. It's actually the love for Christ that motivates you to do those things, if you think about it. So how about asking ourselves a simple question in everything that we do or might condone? Before we condone something, before we celebrate with somebody that we love, how about asking a simple question like, is this godly? Is this of God? Or maybe, is this celebrating ungodliness? Just before you do anything. It's like a quick check. Listen, I love them. I'm biased towards them. I know I'm biased towards them. And they want me to come to this thing, let's say, whatever they're celebrating. Um, and you have to say, is, that, is it godly or not? Is it against God or not? And love for God motivates that kind of on-guard lifestyle. If you love God, to whatever degree you love God, if you love God, you'll be on guard for Him. You'll be on guard because you're protecting His name. Because don't forget, if somebody knows you're a believer in Christ, and they might even hold that against you in the back of their minds, but if someone knows you're a believer in Christ, and you condone a certain thing by celebrating that thing with them that is ungodly, you just compromised. They know they got you to compromise, and you hurt the Lord's name. You really, you did. You, you didn't stick up for truth. And as we just read, you can stick up for truth and still do it in love. So ask that question. Is it godly? Am I celebrating ungodliness by participating in this thing with this person that I love? So David had his reality check. In Psalm 55, we're not going to turn there again today, but, you know, it, he said in verse 13, it is you, a man, my equal, my companion, and my familiar friend. We who had sweet fellowship together walked in the house of God in the throng. That was the one that came against them. And that was the same one whose speech was smoother than butter, but his heart was war. It, it, it's, if it happened to David, it's going to happen to us. So David's looking back, seeing how his so-called friends hurt him and distracted him from God's plan, trying to pull him away. And we also saw this in our Lord's life. People will even uh, act like our friends, religious people even, using the Lord's name, possibly to seduce us over to their side and their way of thinking. Let's turn to Luke 20, verse 19. Luke 20, 19. If they did this to the Lord, they're going to do it to you. Religious people even acting like our friends and even using the name of the Lord to trip us up. And it, what the Spirit's saying is it's happening right now in our lives. And we don't see it, a lot of us. Luke twenty nineteen. The scribes and the chief priests tried to lay, lay hands on him that very hour. And they feared the people, for they understood that he spoke this parable against them. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be righteous in order that they might catch him in some statement so that they could deliver him to the rule and the authority of the governor. They questioned him, saying, now get ready, here comes the buttering up smooth as oil speech first. They questioned him, saying, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach correctly, and you're not partial to anybody, but teach the way of God in truth. So now that I've softened you up, teacher, let me try to catch you off guard. You don't think people do that in your own lives? People that you know personally? You don't think they do this to you? I know you know the Bible. I know you know what God says and you fear God. That's, that's wonderful for you. I'm happy for you. But what about this? And they ask an evil question to try to get around God's ways. And you can either be partial and go with them on that so you don't offend them, or you can tell them the truth in love. 
So now they try to catch the Lord off guard after they butter him up in verse 22. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But he detected their trickery and said to them, Show me a denarius. Whose likeness and inscription does it have? They said, Caesar's. And he said to them, Then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they were unable to catch him in a saying in the presence of the people. They were trying to catch him. These were people that, in verse 20, pretended to be righteous. They were spies. The Lord knows all things, right? But if that happened to us, we'd be like, oh, who are those nice people joining our church? Awesome. That's what we'd be like, yeah, hey, come on in, you know? And that's, you know, a good, gracious attitude to have. But be on the alert. Now, Jesus knew where these spies came from, but we often do not. So we need to stay on the lookout for the sake of the Lord's good name. Remember, if you're a believer in Christ, you're representing him on earth. You're representing his person. He's not here now. He's like, I'm your king. I'm going to leave you here to take care of the fields. I'll be back soon, hopefully. But take care of the fields. You represent my name. You represent me. So be on guard. These are often people that already have your ear. And that's the dangerous part. You respect them. They respect you. So it's easy to compromise. You're already in tight with them. So you're in a position of vulnerability. And some people are just waiting to spiritually turn up the heat on you. You don't think they are, but they want more of you. They're a selfish lover. They want more of you. They want more of your time. All in the name of love. They want more of you. So they're going to get you to compromise if they can. Selfish. So beware. Some of them you not only listen to, but you celebrate with them in their worldly successes. Ungodly things. As though that's any real value or goodness in this life. Do you celebrate them and their ungodly things? People you love. As pastor would say, what are we doing? What are we doing? Just stop for a minute and think, am I celebrating ungodliness? There's your answer on whether to engage or not, to be intimate or not with somebody. You might also ask yourself, why are you deceiving them? It's another topic. It's another discussion. But why are you deceiving them going along with their celebrations of things in the world that are giving them false security? Are you helping them celebrate something that they're relying on for security that's going to crumble someday? What kind of friend are you? <laughs> it's another topic. But are you actually helping deceive them in the process while you're being partial? So on the board, we're called to wake up. There's a big difference between being patient with someone who is living in evil and celebrating with someone who's living in evil. There's a big difference. Be patient. Be tolerating of them. Uh, be loving. Be compassionate. Be forgiving. But don't celebrate with someone who's living in evil and condone it. It's like, it's like saying Jesus Christ says this is okay because they know what you believe. If you're celebrating with them, you're subtly submitting to their lifestyle and will be overcome yourself in due time. So guard your heart, guard your soul. You can't take it like you think you can take it. You're being a fool if you get, or even if you stay intimate with certain people that you know are now clearly against God. It's one thing if you don't know yet. It's another thing if they say, you know what? Can we not talk about the God stuff anymore? And they, they, so they're so wrapped up in the world and even evil things. And here you are saying, you know what? I don't want to lose them as a friend or whatever. I don't want to. They're my brother. They're my sister. They're my cousin. They're my this. They're my that. And you compromise. Even though you know where they stand and they know where you stand. So again, be, 
be on guard. Wake up on the board. It's good to be patient with people, but don't celebrate someone living against God. And as the Spirit's told us in the past, allow them to come to you, but you must not turn to them. If people are unwilling to even talk about the things of God around you, or how about this, if they talk about God to appease you, but live life a different way, even once they know where you stand, you're better off separating from them before you start turning towards them. On the board. Remember this, Jeremiah 15, 19, part C. They for their part may turn to you. This was the Lord talking to Jeremiah. His own people were living in evil. And the Lord said to him, They for their part may turn to you, but as for you, you must not turn to them. The Holy Spirit prepped us with this about two months ago when Pastor was on vacation. And now we're hearing the same idea from the pulpit again. And Jeremiah was really sad for his people. He was weeping for his people who simply refused to turn to the Lord. And while he prayed for them passionately, he knew it was time to separate from them physically. Actually, let's end with this passage. Go to Jeremiah 9, verse 1. Jeremiah 9, verse 1. Again, Jeremiah was so sad for his people. Um, he loved them, just like you love some of your family members. And he prayed for them, but he also knew it was time to separate physically from them. So even he himself might not be swayed by them and ultimately deceived, pulled away from the plan of God. Jeremiah 9.1 Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Oh, that I had in the desert a wayfarer's lodging place. He was like looking for a cabin in the mountains, like we think about, right? Oh, that I had in the desert a wayfarer's lodging place, that I might leave my people and go from them. For all of them are adulterers, an assembly of treacherous men. They bend their tongue like their bow. Lies and not truth prevail in the land, for they proceed from evil to evil. And they do not know me, declares the Lord. Let everyone be on guard against his neighbor. And do not trust any brother, because every brother deals craftily. And every neighbor goes about as a slanderer, a liar. Everyone deceives his neighbor and does not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies. They weary themselves, committing iniquity. Your indwelling is in the midst of deceit. Through deceit they refuse to know me, declares the Lord. Notice, through deceit they refuse to know me. Yeah, they're being deceived, but they still refuse. They have a part in this. They refuse to know me. They refuse to call me Lord. Jeremiah, get out. Get away from them. You've tried. You've evangelized them a hundred times. Don't put yourself in that predicament because their lies are treacherous. That web of lies idea, they're sticky. Get out of the situation. Don't be intimate with them anymore. There's a time. So when you continue to hang around people who refuse to come to you, meaning to come over to the fear of God and the gospel, then you are in the throes of being seduced. That's what the Spirit's telling us. You're being seduced by people you love, and you're letting it happen. You're in danger of being seduced and drawn away from your Lord and Savior as your number one priority. Your friends, your loved ones, don't care if you keep going to church. They just don't want the Lord to be your number one priority. That's what Satan's goal is in his deception, using them to deceive you, to pull you away. So the Lord's number two or three or four... Hopefully he keeps going down, says Satan, very slowly, very slowly. I don't need to rush. I got time. 
on the board. This is how seduction works. Seduction doesn't happen in an instant. It happens slowly. It takes time to supplant norms and standards. If seduction's true nature were seen right away, you'd be offended by its ugliness. Seduction is as patient as it is evil. So we shouldn't be surprised when we start seeing what David saw. How friends and loved ones wore masks, pretending to love him, but they were really out for selfish gain of some sort. And whether you want to admit it or not, this is people at your own dinner tables, people that you go spend a lot of time with. Intimate conversations happen. And a lot of them are in it for selfish gain. They want more of you. So they're going to quote unquote lie to you and pressure you and deceive you so they can have more of you. Selfish love. Spirit saying, be on guard. Don't be a fool. <laughs> Just like the Lord said on the board in John 2, 24 and 25. Jesus, for his part, did not trust himself to them because he knew all men. And he did not need anyone to bear witness concerning man. He needed no evidence from anyone about men, for he himself knew what was in human nature. These, he was, this was about the people that were following him. He's like, I'm not going to put my trust in them because I know what's really in I know they're going to let me down. So we mustn't give credit to man as though he were generally good. That's another lie as we close right now. We mustn't give credit to man that he's generally good. Good people. Society and media has trained us that way falsely quite well. But they're good people. Holy Scripture says they're all in sin and deceived. And so we'll close with this idea. Any thinking or lifestyle against God is called evil in the Bible. Any thinking or lifestyle against God is called evil in the Bible. So evil is not always obvious. In fact, it often presents itself as being a good person. Just think about that as we leave tonight. Evil often pre presents itself as being a good person. Just like the friends at the dinner table that David came to know were selfish lovers and against God. So, be on guard. I'm sure we'll continue with this more on Thursday. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word and your spirit guiding us. Help us humbly listen to your message that this is what we need to hear right now even if we don't see it up front help us at least accept the fact that this is going on in our lives and from that point of humility Father open our eyes and help us see our own examples that we need to be careful of our own partiality help us see Father through your spirit you are faithful, we know you're faithful, and we thank you for your faithfulness. And we ask that you give us more humility and faith to see things from your perspective. We ask that you bless us all as we go. It's in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ we pray by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen.